Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ryan Ride Mechanic channel. How are you doing today? Today's video I wanted to talk about, it's a, a follow-up on another video that I did. A while back I did a video on shutting rides down for the night. And so naturally the response in the uh, comments below was they want to say, hey, what about a startup procedure video? So it's taken me a while to uh, get around to it, but I want to do a startup now. So we're going to be talking about how to start rides up for the day. So let's get into it. Now get ready. Here we go. Okay, so today's video I wanted to talk about specifically how to run rides up for the day. And that's uh, basically what this is. This would be considered run-ups. Uh, we're starting the video with the assumption that we know that the ride is PM'd already, that we've already done the preventative maintenance inspection to it, and the ride is sitting signed off, ready to go. Uh, this happens a lot during the startup shutdown time of year. When the park is not open during the week, a lot of parks are like that. A lot of uh, local regional parks are like that. Uh, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the park will be closed. And typically on those things, uh, the ride is PM'd on Monday, and then Friday morning you do a run-up. Um, some, sometimes even Thursday evening you do a run-up just to make sure it's going to be ready for Friday morning. Uh, so we're going to talk about run-up scenarios here. And just like the first video, I'm going to do three rides. I'm going to do a very small kids ride. I'm going to do a medium size flat ride and I'm going to do a major roller coaster so we'll get into those three examples before that I did want to say thank you for coming back for those of you that are finding your way back to the channel I do appreciate it for those of you that might be new here this might be your first video you're watching please like and subscribe and check out what I have to offer I've got a lot already made down there and uh, if you feel like you're missing something Hey, give me a shout out anytime and I can point you in the right direction. Say, hey, you have a video made for something like this already? And I might just respond with, yeah, I do. And that's the end of that. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about, let's start off with a kid's ride like you would find. Uh, let's use something like a Zamparilla airplane ride, you know, a little six or eight plane startup ride. There's not much to these at all. So what do we do when we go there? First thing we do is show up to the ride. We typically park a truck, golf cart, whatever you might be in. Uh, then we hop out. First thing, we check the queue line. Again, most of the time on run-ups, this ride has been sitting static now for, you know, three or four days. So there's no telling. You know, I have lots of departments crisscrossing around the park. So there's really no telling exactly what might have happened to this ride while it's been down. So we go check the queue line, uh, make sure everything's intact and nobody ran a truck into something. Uh, then you go check the perimeter fencing, make sure it's intact. Next thing, always safety signage out front. That's the number one thing. Check that safety signage out there. Make sure it's intact. Um, because you're doing a run-up, that means that the ride would be partially signed off at that point in time. Um, and by that is that the uh, person operating, or the person that inspected the ride, would typically sign off proper operation, but there would be a slash or another entry waiting for that. And that would be for the person that runs it up on the day it opens, to actually confirm, yes, that everything was working properly at that point in time. So we're going to go around. First thing we're going to do is throw our lockout on there uh, just to make sure. We're going to throw the lockout on the main power. We're going to go in. We're going to look at the center structure real quick. Going to push it around, make sure it still turns freely. Nothing's happening in there. Um, you know, during certain times of years, uh, little critters can get in there and work really fast. So you want to make sure like as soon as you start turning it like wasps don't start flying out of somewhere because that could not be fun when you try to do that stuff. So we just give it a real quick once over on the inside open up the air tanks because that particular ride is going to have air on it. So we're going to open up the air tanks real quick and make sure there's no water left inside the tank uh, that might have accumulated while it was sitting 
and then we're going to check the air compressor just because that's like the majority of one of those rides so I'm going to check the air compressor real quick and just make sure it's got oil in the sight glass before we put it into service uh, then after that we're going to come back undo the lockout really quick and we're going to look at the fire extinguisher make sure it's charged within a year date and then we're going to check the phones make sure phones can call out and they work and that uh, all the operator interfaces are still legible and present. And again, you know, I'm saying a lot of stuff, but really this is very just a very quick visual. Yep, yep, okay. Phone's a little harder to do, but you pick it up, listen for a dial tone. Most of the time the way phones die, pick them up, they're dead. And that's it. It's very rare you pick it up and there's a dial tone and then you start pressing numbers and nothing happens. But, I mean, if you wanted to, you can call, dial a number really quick, and at least make sure it starts ringing if you really wanted to. You could do that. Uh, so then we're going to go ahead, take the key, turn it on, power on. For those small little kids' rides, there's really, really not much to them. So we're going to take the main key, turn the power on. The air compressor is going to fire up. We're going to let it sit there for about three or four minutes while the air compressor builds a charge. During that time, there's really not much to do. You're just kind of sitting there like a bump on a log. Maybe you turn on YouTube real quick and start watching another Ryan the Ride Mechanic video. Whatever, I'm fine with it. Go ahead. No one's around, no one's looking. It's fine. That air compressor's got a while to build up a charge. Uh, so, and then we wait. And then after that couple minutes has passed by, everything looks good. Make sure the gates are closed and then kids rides like that they're really simple you take your operator present key put it in click it uh, to the operator present and then simply just press start foot pedal on some of them push your foot down on the pedal hit the start button and just watch it run and mainly for those kiddie rides all you're doing is waiting for the timer to time out uh, some of them you like airplanes you can manually raise them all up and then let them all back down just to verify they function still um, as far as checking the internal interfaces, like the joystick that's in there, not too much you can do um, unless you take a lot of time running it up. Like, I have watched mechanics. I can't fault them for doing this, but, I mean, it takes a lot of time. They took their little response bag, their little ride purse, and they went over and hung it on the joystick so it was back. Then they went over, turned the ride on, hit start, that one airplane would go up and then they hit stop and then they go back and move their bag one over so they would verify function of all the joysticks can't fault them for doing that but uh it takes a long time to do on a run-up and it's not so much like well it may just take an extra couple of minutes it's like yeah but typically run-ups you have a stack of rides to run up you might have 15 or 20 rides to get run up and you're typically against a ticking clock. I mean, the park is going to open. So you wanna make sure you get those done quickly. Um, so ride operators, they tend to come in, do the same thing. So there, there's lots of redundancy built into these as well. So it's not too much slips through the cracks on them. Uh, the next thing is they will test the stop button again, simply just with it mid cycle press stop make sure the equipment does stop and then most of the time they will press the e-stop again and make sure the ride behaves the way it's supposed to um, after that they pretty much sign the paperwork off just stating that maintenance has been there and inspected the ride and the rides cleared for operation lots of parks do this many different ways some parks have paperwork to sign some parks use digital apps to clear it at a central database some parks use a whiteboard, like a grease board up there, then simply just says they sign their name on the grease board. And I don't honestly know how those work. Maybe someone comes by and takes a picture of it. Where I was, the state wanted to audit everything, and you couldn't audit a grease board that was just sitting out in the middle of the open. They want to see signatures on paperwork. Um, but that, also, that all depends on how the park has those procedures written down. Okay? So at that point, that ride's done. We hop back in the cart, truck, whatever it might be, off to the next ride. So that's it for the kiddie rides. They're really, really simple, self-explanatory. Almost anyone can run them up. Um, 
The next thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about a mild, big uh, flat ride. So by that, I mean this is more of like a high thrill carnival ride you would find somewhere. Not a roller coaster, but it's big. It's typically bigger. So things like that we have like big stuff. You got like a Frisbee. We've got a, a swinger, like a wave swinger type deal, like a, a swings ride. You have top spins. You have all sorts of larger rides. And this is also where like uh, bumper cars and things like that would fall into uh, midway type rides that you would find at fairs and carnivals. So these rides typically are much bigger and they use bigger motors too. So one of the key things with motors is that once you get up into those big high torque rides like that, they don't use a lot of AC motors, they use DC, direct current motors. And DC motors have to be warm. They've got to be nice and warm. They've got to have the field energized on them. So if you're in an area that's prone to moisture, fog, uh, heavy rain, high humidity, the, you want to make sure those motors turn on early. And if they have blower motors on them, turn the blower motors on and get air moving through them. Turn the fields on, get the fields warmed up to where that motor is nice and warm and has lots of air going through it by the time you show up there and you're ready to run the ride. So let's talk about a, let's use a, a wave swinger. Uh, the one I worked on was a Zamprilla called the Flying Carousel. Uh, it had 48 seats on it. I think it was 48. It was a lot. A lot of seats on there. Um, these, this particular model was hydraulically lifted and it had two DC motors running the center. Um, some of these, I know, I know there's some out there by maybe Gerschlauer, maybe, or it might be Mack Rides. Can't remember. Uh, they use hydraulic drives for both the lifting and the rotation. They just use hydraulics for everything. Better, worse, I'm not sure. I've never worked on a hydraulic drive one. I've only worked on the electric ones. Um, they're probably cleaner. <laughs> you got hydraulics and grease in the same spot. You know, that's that can get pretty messy. But uh, they're probably a little bit cleaner than that. So for a wave swinger, let's just say, we can go through a flying carousel. We can go through and we'll do the same thing. We'll pull up, we'll check the queue line, check the perimeter fencing. Uh, we'll throw the lockout on real quick. And then for those rides, you wanna open up the center. The center is a nice cylindrical column that doesn't look like much of anything. And you're just like, well, how do you get in there? And typically there's an access panel. One of those fiberglass panels around there, if you look at it carefully, one of them has two screws, top and bottom, they're Allen screws. Put an Allen key in there, undo them, and then the door opens up and a ladder typically folds out from the inside. Allows the mechanic access to get inside there and do the inspection. So for this case, all we wanna do here is we're gonna open that door up and we don't really have to climb inside on a run up, but we're gonna stick our head in there and look around and make sure that the last mechanic didn't leave like ropes coming from the top down, that there wasn't like a bucket of oil on the inside or a bunch of stuff just torn apart sitting there for some reason. Like these would be major safety violation stuff. That's where I would, as a supervisor, I would get a call that said just, hey, you need to come down here to this ride. And I'd be like, why? And they're like, I'll tell you when you get here. And it's like, oh man. This is going to end bad for somebody. So um, not that often that stuff happens, but everything's in the name of safety. You don't want to, you don't want to mess things up on those rides because they get on the inside. Once you're past all the guarding, some of those things are really delicate. Like if you, you can leave a rope on the inside and completely destroy a set of slip rings and slip rings are not cheap by any stretch of the imagination. They are super expensive. Thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for one set of slip rings. And these things have like 20 or 30 stacked on top of there to transmit power and signal and stuff like that through there. So 
you definitely want to be inside, uh, very careful inside around guarded areas. So we're going to button the center back up. We're going to go back to remove the lockout, but before we move the lockout, we're going to step in to the hydraulic room, which is typically somewhere, if not in, the control room. And we're going to go into that hydraulic room and we're going to check inside there. Same thing. Nothing's torn apart. There is plenty of hydraulic fluid in the reservoir. Everything looks like it can go into operation in the control room. Since something like that would have a control room, there's a fire extinguisher and it's within date and charged sitting inside there. Any access ways in or out of the building are not blocked. There's nothing up against electrical cabinets. Basic housekeeping stuff. Again, the rides were sitting static for four days. Maybe they were being worked on and someone just finished a project on it and they didn't clean up well after themselves. These are all potential violations if, uh, oh sure, someone else like were to walk in and see that. So you want to make sure if you find that stuff, you get rid of it quickly. And typically you have to alert management so they can take the appropriate action against whoever left it there in the first place because that's a, typically a culture problem at that point in time. Nobody likes culture problems. So we're going to take our lockout off, turn the main power on, make sure all of our DC equipment it comes back on. We have fans going, field is energized. Sometimes the older rides, especially when you turn that main disconnect back on, sometimes a circuit breaker will trip somewhere inside the cabinet. Even though nothing's on, just that first initial shock power coming through the system sometimes trips a circuit breaker and you have to go through and turn those back on. Not that often, but it's possible. You might save you some time, but it's not every single one. It's not like turn the power on, then open the cabinet up and see what happened. If this is happening, this is going to be a problematic thing that people know about. You know, it's like, oh, that one breaker that trips all the time. And you know it when you open it up because you'll see the cabinet and everything is pristine and nice and clean. And then you get to one breaker and there's Sharpie marks around it and there's greasy fingerprints all around it and everything else. And you could just tell looking at it, just like, you're having problems with that breaker, aren't you? <laughs> and uh, most of the time these things, parks try to fix it. Breaker keeps tripping, must be bad. So they put a new breaker in there and then keeps tripping. So it's, it runs a brake. So we replace the brake. Keeps tripping. Replace the wire to it. Keeps tripping. Don't know why. It keeps tripping. A lot of times that is some, some sort of a design flaw. There's an inrush of current at some point in time. But it's typically nothing so crazy that engineers want to dive back into it. It's, they're considered nuisance trips. So just turn the thing back on if something like that were to happen, right? So we're going to go back out to the panel turn the power on and something like that, you would have to turn the main power on, you have to pull the e-stop up, then you would have to start the hydraulics at that point in time, listen for the hydraulics to start up. Um, most of the time there's really nothing externally to show you that they're running, maybe just a simple, a light on, just says hydraulics are on. Um, at that point in time, you'd walk around again making sure everything was clear, clear of the swings, their door was shut, um, perimeter, everything, like no one came in while you were in the control room and they're just back there having a cup of tea in the back of the thing. <laughs> like, oh, I thought we'd just vacation here for the day. How are you? Uh, so you get back around, come back up to the main panel, and then let's see, a ride like that, we're gonna say, to start it, you're gonna need a foot pedal at the bottom. You're going to need an operator present key on the panel. And then you're going to need a ride like that would probably also have a palm switch, something you'd have to constantly keep depressed. So something like that might actually use a palm switch on the panel and a foot pedal down below with an operator present key switch. So you have actually three things you have to make happy to run the ride. And then you hit start. And then DC rides... This is very common with run-ups. DC rides, you get out there, I do all that stuff, I press the start button, and it starts up and starts moving just a couple feet, and then everything shuts off. So I go back into the control room, and there's an error, and it's just like drive fault. DC drive fault. It's like, okay, reset it, 
Go back out there, hit start again. This time it moves 10 feet and then it shuts off. Go back, DC drive fault. This is kind of normal with old DC drives, motors, that type of stuff. They, when they get cold and they sit for a long time after four days, these things do not want to run and they really start causing problems. So sometimes mechanics might sit out at one of these older rides for 15, 20, 30 minutes sometimes just trying to start the ride and it's not working. Sometimes I've told mechanics, hey, go back because it's like one of their first rides or two. It's like, hey, go back, come back uh, more closer towards park opening when it's warmer and it's the sun's out and everything else. Like, try it then and then come back to there. So just start, fault, start, fault, start, fault until it eventually gets running on its own. And then most of the time, once you get a handful of like four or five successful cycles on that ride, it's pretty bulletproof for the rest of the day. They don't really have a lot of problems on that. So we do the normal thing while it's running. You would, once it gets successful cycles running, running and you want to make sure I say successful because you don't want to interrupt the cycle with a stop, an e-stop or something like that if it is not successfully cycling because now you don't know did it fault at the same time you pushed the button or was it just a coincidence like like if in the morning time i hit start and then as soon as it starts moving i hit stop maybe the stop button doesn't work but the ride just happened to fault out at the exact same time so i want to make sure i get like three or four or five successful cycles on it where it's running the way it should be then i hit the stop button and make sure it reacts the way it's supposed to. Then I hit the e-stop button and I make sure it reacts the way it's supposed to. Come down, same thing. Reset everything, run two more successful cycles on it, and then sign the paperwork off that it was maintenance was there, it's cleared, it's ready to run, and then go ahead and leave the paperwork head off to the next ride. Okay, so we've talked now about uh, small kitty rides. We've talked about a medium flat ride, which is the point of those is you gotta keep those DC motors warmed up and ready to go uh, because they will be a pain in the butt until then. So now we're gonna move on to the big boys. We're gonna move into a roller coaster. And for this, there are two different types of roller coasters out there. Uh, both of them, you have your major big roller coasters out there that are nothing special, uh, nothing crazy, I should say. And then you move into these other, they're more like a family roller coaster that require a little bit of warm up. And for this one, uh, I'm going to start with the family Tivoli roller coaster. Tivoli, Tivoli, not sure how to say that. I've heard it pronounced multiple ways from all sorts of people. So for that, we're gonna use a Tivoli coaster. We had one that was 20 coaches long. And these things have no chain lift hill, they have drive tires going up the lift hill. So what we do there is we show up, lock the ride out, of course, to start with, and then we go through the infield. And the first thing we do going through the infield is check the perimeter fencing. Perimeter fencing is very important in every roller coaster because a lot of times the perimeter fence lines up against the outside of the park in a lot of areas. So what you're actually looking for is people that have tried cutting and jumping the fence to get into the park for some reason. Uh, I'm not sure why you'd want to do that, but there's obviously those people out there. Uh, so you check the perimeter fence and make sure it's intact, and then you're going to go around if your area has lots of theming to it, lots of trees and bushes, you're gonna make sure that nothing has fallen down and draped itself across the track in some area. That could be detrimental to almost any roller coaster, definitely cause it to valley. Um, so we walk around and we check to make sure like if you have uh, subterranean areas that there's no water in them, uh, footers are clear of everything that might be, you know, there might've been mud or something from the week, uh, something along those lines. Uh, as long as everything's clear, come back, do your normal check, you do your station, you do your queue, you do your safety signage. Go back, check the fire extinguisher, uh, operator interfaces, things like that. And then for a Tavali coaster, they actually require warm-up before they can run. So what you do is you actually turn the ride on, 
and at that point the air compressor starts running and then you would go into uh, a maintenance mode and you would I mean while the air compressor is charging you're going to check some of your other basics at that point like at that point I would open the restraints and go back and lock each one on the way down so I would listen for all the restraints on the way down then I would open the air gates close the air gates make sure they worked it's important to get a full open stroke and full closed stroke to verify that the sensors are working properly because sometimes you go open and then you wait for a second and then the ride faults out that there's a pos open position gate fault. So you want to verify the open and closed position. And then again, this is stuff like sensors. A lot of times they don't like waking up sometimes they, when they're cold and haven't been used in a while, they don't like working that well. Don't know why it's not a guaranteed thing. Just sometimes you run into problems. A lot of times it's just sensors that should be replaced but nobody ever does it. They just take the occasional fault and just kind of shrug your shoulders and go, well, it faults every once in a while, but it's just during warm up and it doesn't affect anybody. So they say, okay, we'll just let that run. All right. Uh, while it's the compressor is charging up, then this ride that I'm talking about doesn't really require much air pressure except for it to open the brake. So by that point in time, there's enough air pressure to open the brake up so you switch the ride into maintenance mode and then you hit the start lift conveyance button and then that sends the train it's it's a special warm-up function that the Tabali coaster has built into it. it sends a train up 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 and it actually starts to crest the top over the hill and then stops and then at what that point you take the selector switch and you go from convey and then you go to release the brakes and then all those booster wheels that are up the lift hill all those booster wheels release the brake and just they don't turn the motor backwards they just allow the motor to turn backwards since the motors have sprags on them that only allow the wheels to turn one way they can't turn backwards so all the motors together act as the anti rollback device for the lift hill even though it's not really necessary because there's only one train but in case someone jumps in behind, they have to e-stop it. They don't want the train rolling back down. But in this case, we want to warm the train up because 20 coaches, nylon wheels, lots of bearings that are sealed that, you know, have their own, like, just regular EP2 grease in them. They need to be warmed up. Otherwise, every time you send that train when it's cold, it will valley every single time. And it is a giant pain in the butt to unvalley one of those things because they are so big and so long. Um, definitely not as bad as a major roller coaster to unvalley, but they're a pain still. You don't want to do it. It'll, it'll tag on an extra two and a half hours. Plus you need eight guys to try to move the thing to get it back up and over. Um, so once up, up at the top, you release all the brakes and that opens the brake in the station, which is a pinch brake. And then it unlocks all the wheels, all the drive wheels. It unlocks those and allows them to free spin backwards. That allows the train to roll backwards into the station. Now, every park's different that has one of these Tavali style coasters. Um, they all have different measurements on them. Ours, what we used was the front of the coach and the back of the coach. So <laughs> we would see how cold it was judging by where the front of the coach stopped. So uh, on the first run on a cold morning, you'd run it up the lift hill, open the brakes, and let it roll backwards into the station. And the nose of the train wouldn't even come back into the station. It was still sitting out in front of the station. And it's like, whoo, man, that is cold. The rear coach has a hump in the back that it has to go over to the last thing in the, in the track is it's a little hill that comes up and over and goes back down. Um... The rear coach would be like eight coaches away from that hump. And so as you would start to do this, you would say, okay, turn the lift motors on. The train would go forward, up the lift, and then stop. And then you switch the switch back over and open the brakes and then let it roll backwards. And then it would coast back. And when it stops coasting, that's when you say how far it is. Now, what we used to do is we used to say that back coach had to go not only up into that hump, but we actually had to get three coaches up into that hump. 
once we are three coaches up in the hump, we are like, the wheels have warmed up enough to make it around the track. Now, is that a guarantee it'll make it around the track? Absolutely not. There is no guarantee it will make it around that track. Uh, one of the things we do for uh, to help it along is we would go through and spray lubricant. Uh, what did we use there? Was that... Uh, I think we used food grade silicone uh, and sprayed that along the top of the track on the road wheel surface because the surface isn't treated on those particular rides and during the three, four, five days of downtime the ride has, it already starts to corrode and grow rust. Not a lot, but rust is like, um, it's like, a, it's like a layer of clothing that you put on top of steel. So it, it's like running through fabric almost, and it scrubs a ton of speed off of the train. So the wheels, the nylon wheels, will pound the rust off of the track. But those first couple cycles, it's a lot of times very iffy if it's going to make it back. So most mechanics on a run-up day will go through and use half a can of silicone and just spray it all on the low spots because when you're lubing the track you don't have to do more than the low spots because the train carries it everywhere it goes. Uh, those Tavali coasters are pretty low to the ground so a lot of times mechanics will overdo the lubrication just to try to help it back the first time because I don't think like if you've worked anywhere near a Tavali coaster you've probably valleyed a Tavali coaster. It's not like a shameful thing to do. It just happens, and it happens a lot. It happens a lot. Um, so we get that train going back and forth, and when those last three coaches went up and over that hump enough, we would bring it back in, home it right where it's supposed to be, switch the ride into full automatic mode, and then we'd say a little prayer and press a start button. And then, just like it's been doing this entire time, brakes open, all the lift wheels turn on, it starts to conveyance, and it drives the train up. But this time, instead of stopping at the top of the lift hill, it sends it over all the way. And then that first cycle is always a heart-pounding cycle. Because with that train, you just don't know if it's going to make it. Is it going to make it? And you find the watch it. And it's always our particular ride. It was the second-to-last coaster. It went up over this little hill on a 90-degree turn. And all the time, it would go up there. And you'd see it slow down, sometimes even stop on that hill. And it was like, oh, come on, please make it, please make it, please make it. And then it would start to continue rolling forward and then come back to the station. It was like, whoo, man. I was the type of person I like to start and stop each cycle. So I would send it around, it would come back into the station and stop. I'd send it around again, come back in and stop. Other mechanics did that once just to verify it's working. And then on those, they have right on the panel, they've got a cycle select on there, which is simply just a little push button with a counter underneath it. So you hit the little plus button and it just goes mechanically click. It goes to one, goes click two, click three, click four. And mechanics would go up and turn it up to like four. And what would happen is that as it's running around, instead of lift shutting down, it would stay running the entire time and it would count as the train passed through. So it would run the train four cycles, and then on, on before the fifth cycle, it would stop the train. So that was kind of a shortcut, but operations wasn't allowed to use that. They were only allowed to use it on the one cycle setting. So we typically don't run the machine too much outside of what operation is allowed to use because it doesn't really test the function that well. Uh, you get to go up and you say, well, it, it worked fine on five cycles this morning. So then my first question, well, well, did you test it on one cycle? Well, no. It's like, and now we have a problem. So that's your fault. But um, so we run that thing around and we get it warmed up. It's working just fine. Heaven forbid the thing valleys. Then you've got to call out, like I said, about eight mechanics. And then you have to get this like seesaw going. You can run it backwards up the last little valley before that, last hill before that. And then with about eight guys, there's enough energy. You can literally push the thing, get a good running start at it and push. Is it the best? No, no, it's not. Is it safe? Not really, because you have a train. You're actually standing there pushing. 
um, which is a handful of tons by itself. I'm honestly not sure how much that train weighed, but it probably weighed close to like four tons, five tons easily, I could say. Um, and then what, what the big threat was, it wasn't actually getting caught up in the train or anything else. The actual, the big threat was with eight people, you had to get even people on both sides to push while you're running through the infield trying to push that. If one of the mechanics were to trip and fall, now you have a bigger hazard. Now, if somebody else tripped and fell over them, they can get actually like get a hand into an assembly or something like that. So it's quite dangerous, but most of the time we opted to use winches, come alongs, that sort of stuff, and just mechanically pull the train forward. If the front plaza area was clear at the time, we could actually get a truck outside and actually hook a train, you know, hook a cable up to it with it, cable running underneath the train, and then a lifting, a lifting uh, strap around the back of the coach in just a U-shape. So it was enough to pull the whole train forward just with the truck. And then once it started moving on its own, the U-shaped saddle just allowed the last bit of the brake fin to come undone while it started to accelerate and drift away. Um, that would that was the ideal thing to do, quickest, easiest way to do it. So uh, that was the Tavali coaster. And then at the end, you, of course, you sign the paperwork off, stating that you've been there. And then that one, we had, it was one of the last rides to run up because that warm-up process, we didn't want it to go away because if it would sit there, it would get cold valley again. So that was the last one to warm up, and we typically made sure that was being done with maintenance running it as operations was getting there. So we turned it over, and there wasn't any waiting. We did it before where we operations showed up at like 20 minutes to park opening like they normally do. We turned the ride over to them, signed it off, and then we get a call 20 minutes after park opening that the ride valleyed. And we're like, with people on it? And they said, no, they were test running it. What happened? Well, we got there, we signed the ride off, and then the operations started doing other stuff. They started uh, getting water for the day. They started emptying trash cans. They did everything possible but run the ride. And they let it sit for over half an hour until they decided to run it again. And then it valleyed. Can't win them all, but we try. We try to at least be consistent for that stuff. Okay, so we're done with the Diwali coaster. Now we're going to go, we're going to get the big coaster in the park. We're going to pull out a, a B&M with two trains. So where do we start with that? The first thing we do is we go to the control room and we put our lockout on the ride. I think you're noticing a pattern with this whole lockout thing. Yeah, safety is important. Uh, so we put the lockout on the ride and then we go to, we typically go through the infield next. The infield is where we start and you're gonna go through and check any fences, make sure everything is up, secure, no one's tried to break in. No one doing some sort of uh, fast and the furious driving slid through the fence and is now upside down in the middle of the infield somewhere. Uh, nothing like that is happening. Everything's intact. There's not a tree that fell on top of the track. There's not a... Uh, oh, oh, by the way, the, uh, the camera guys came in on Wednesday and they installed a conduit directly underneath the rail of the track. Like the train would hit this conduit. We made sure stuff like that didn't happen while we weren't using the ride. Um, and then once we verified everything's clean, everything's clear, we typically at that point, the mechanic that's doing that also carries a bottle of track lube around with them. And this is again, something, the low spots you go through and you just put about two and a half, three feet of track lube on each rail, just the road wheel surface, you put it on there. Uh, because that stuff, as it gets hot throughout the day, it will start to move around that rail. It will drip down to the bottom. Not so much drip, but I mean, as it goes itself around, goes away around, it will get the road surface, and then it will hit the guide, and then it will get to the up stop, and the train will carry it throughout the entire track. So that's an easy thing to do. We just add some track lube while we're out there doing that. The same thing, we made sure there's no 
uh, footers that have gathered a ton of water. Um, nothing like that in there. There's nothing submerged. You would also go to the top of the lift just to verify there's nothing out there. Also the top of the block brakes if the ride is equipped with block brakes just to make sure no service has happened up there where there's also again cords, hoses draped across the track. You're always looking for obstructions. That's the biggest thing. And then we head back. On our way back, that's when we check the, now we check the queue line, check the safety signage, make sure there's nothing wrong with the station area. We come up there uh, into the top of the queue line, and then we check the station area. Same thing, safety signage, fire extinguishers are in date, phones work, the system looks like it's ready to go. Uh, at that point in time, we go downstairs, remove the lockout from the ride because our infield has now been sealed up. Everything is locked, in some cases double locked. Cedar Fair, if Six Flags and Cedar Fair join all their procedures like that, Cedar Fair will start adding a ton of locks to their infields because Six Flags requires two locks to their infields while Cedar Fair does not have that policy. We turn the ride on and then what we do, first thing I do is go out and start the air compressor. Start putting, I call it, <laughs> just me, I call it putting some squeeze in the tanks. So we start adding that compressed air into those tanks as the ride starts coming up. Now I make my way up into the train house. Train house is located in many different spots on a lot of different rides, but B&Ms typically have a train house somewhere, and by that I mean a transfer track um, where the trains are sitting static. Now, as the trains sit there, when I walk up there, it depends on the type of train you have. If you have a stand-up train, or a floorless train, you have the train will be sitting there and its belly on the center will have a bunch of vertical wheels underneath it. And all the weight of the train is actually sitting on all those vertical wheels underneath the belly of that train. And then the coach has these plastic UHMW slides on either side of the coach itself. And those are sitting in metal brackets on both sides. And that helps guide the coach and prevent it from teeter-tottering too far. So that allows the train to sit there, typically with the wheel carriers just hanging on nothing. They're just sitting out in the open. And then you can also get to the top side on a lot of these things and check restraints and stuff like that. If you wanted to, I typically don't because there's a fall hazard up there. Not like it's not safe enough for, I'm not going to do that because it's not safe. It's just, it's an unnecessary risk to take. So I wait until I put the trains in the station to work on the restraints and stuff like that. Inverted coasters, however, it's the opposite problem. You, don't, you, you can work on the restraints just fine there on the ground level, but you have to climb up high to work on the wheel carriers. There might be access ladders or there might be an elevated platform next to it. It all depends on the way the ride was installed and who said, yeah, we should do this. This is a good idea. This is a bad idea. When I go up into the train house, I'm not really double checking the train itself. Very minor. I'm checking the big stuff. Are all of the wheels there? Yes. Are all of the hitches connected? Yes. Okay. Uh, there is a very, very fine line to walk between checking the train really quick just to make sure there's nothing interfering with it that's going to put it into operation and then going over someone else's PM. And I, know I get a lot of people that say, well, it wouldn't hurt to go over that train again. It, it wouldn't hurt to go over that train again, but at what point in time does a manager or supervisor say, why are we spending six hours to inspect that train? And the guy says, well, it only took me three hours to inspect that train. Well, yeah, but then the other mechanic went there and it took another three hours for that person to inspect the train. And then the manager or the director will step in and say, why are we inspecting the train twice? Because we don't trust somebody? Is that what it is? In that case, that person shouldn't be working here if we don't trust the work that they do. That's a simple fix, but it is kind of, it's a, it's a cover your ass scenario, right? Like we want to make sure, like if I'm putting my name on there that the ride's in operation, I want to look at it, but it's, it's kind of like that dance. How much do you really want to look at it? And how much time do you really want to spend on it? Knowing that somebody else has already done it. 
So I walk through, I check the big stuff. I check to make sure all the wheels are there, the hitches are connected, and there's nothing laying on the train. I do look for tattletale signs. Like if I'm walking down the train and I'm checking my basics and I notice that there's hitch safety plates sitting on the ground. Where do those come from? That will cause me to stop and look around. It's like, what's going on? Let's start looking at the hitches. Do all of them have their safety plates? Was a hitch put together without its safety plate? Was this just poor housekeeping? Somebody forgot to throw it away? Or did somebody take something apart and forget to put it back together? Like, which, which level do we have to worry about in this case? Uh, look for other things. Typically, it's tools and hoses and things like that draped across the train that you don't want to drag into the transfer because that'll break a lot of stuff too. Um, they don't like getting air hoses caught up inside of uh, wheel carriers and things like that. So we go up, look at the train, make sure everything's okay, it's ready to come out. And then I go back downstairs, then I head back up to the operator's station at that point in time. Now, once I'm up there, now we have the fun task of transferring trains onto the track. And the process, some B&Ms, is really easy. Some rides are really hard. Some rides take a couple of people to do. I've, we've talked a little bit about this transferring process on some other videos, and it can get really complicated or super simple at the same time. I've, I worked on an SLC where our transfer mechanism just did not work good at all. Didn't work at all. Something about the ride being relocated one time, we could not get transfer to work all the time. Not like electrically, like, I don't know, the wheels didn't turn on or something. It was like mechanical bind in the transfer assembly that we could not undo because we would have to take the transfer track apart and like off of the ride. Big crane work stuff that pretty much wasn't going to happen. So that ride sometimes took an hour to transfer a train. Uh, most B&M rides, from the comments I get from most of you out there, they're pretty simple. They just take, I mean, mine took about five minutes per train to transfer one. It was really easy. And then there are other rides out there, like I was, I personally watched them pull a train off of, which would be the same process in reverse, uh, an Intamin uh, impulse coaster at, uh, what was that, at California Adventure over at Disney. They just took the train right off in one shot. They didn't even bring operations down. It was like, wow, that was really cool. Same process for putting them back on, too. So that could go really quick. You know, you could you have the opposite there. Um, so, so we have to start the ride up first. And so you put the keys in. You have to turn the ride on. Then you have to turn the maintenance mode on. Then you have to turn what's called maintenance bypass on. And then at that point, everything starts flashing. B&M's, uh, I'm gonna go for the one I worked on, which was the control system was developed by Consign. Uh, from what I understand, they actually did a, a bunch of the B&M projects. So Consign did the control system, so startup procedure might be the same, might not, don't know, be interesting to hear. So you turn all the keys on and everything's flashing rhythmically. All the lights blink at the same time over the entire track. There's panels all over the track with ride start buttons or MOP buttons and a ride stop button. And the purpose when you start the ride up for everything rhythmically flashing like that is so you can walk around the track and lift and brakes and blocks and everything and look at those areas and say, is that light flashing? Yes, it is. If it's not, guess what? You have a burnt out light bulb. You should replace that. Does it have to be done before the ride is open? should be is, is it critical safety no would, would it cause confusion later on in the day if the ride went down and you're at that panel and you're like the ride's not started the ride's not started yeah you could add 15 20 minutes on to a ride call because you didn't know that the bulb was burnt out so things like that should be replaced as soon as possible so you hit the acknowledge button and all those lights stop blinking and then the ride start just starts flashing what it wants you to do is push and hold ride start. You hold it for about three seconds, that light goes out. Take your hand off, wait about three seconds. Ride start starts flashing again. That's basically, hey, are you sure? You sure you wanna start the ride up? And you go, yes. 
and then you hit ride start again and then hold it it goes out and then that was its last safety it says okay it's in your hands now ride start starts flashing for the third time and then you go ride start and then all the lights on the panel now start blinking because now we're in manual mode and all the functions work in manual mode i don't I have a lot of safety bypassed because I'm in manual mode. It's again, it was kind of like we talked about, uh, I think on the Smiler video I did, it was one of those things that's like, you, you have to be careful in a lot of rides when you're in manual mode because it'll let you do things that the safety system of the ride is kind of somewhat bypassed in manual, but it's not, but it, it is. It doesn't function the same way. So you, you have to be on edge when you're when you're working with a ride in manual mode. So at that point in time, you're ready to turn the ride into transfer. There might be some other things. Um, I have experience with a floorless coaster. So one thing you have to do with a floorless coaster that inverts don't need and stand-ups don't need is you have to remove the floor because most of the time the ride is stored with the robotic flooring in the up and locked position. So take uh, go into the panel view go into the flooring system and hit combs that's what they were called it combs down the combs come down they open up and they lock into the open position now all the booster wheels are available everything's available at this point in time this is where i like to test everything on the track bnms are great because they allow you to do everything i take it and i turn the booster motors on the station turn them on and off a couple times same with the ones in transfer, on and off a couple times. At lift base, on and off a couple times. Lift hill, I run it at slow speed for about 30 seconds, which is a long time to hold the lift slow speed button. But I let it jog for about 30 seconds and make sure I don't hear anything funny going on over there. And I run the lift at high speed for about 30 seconds and make sure that DC motor is woken up and it's working at the lift base. Then I start actuating my safety brakes, listen to them. Every time I hit the button, I should hear them all go thunk. Same thing with the service brakes. The hard ones for most people, unless they're really close, that is, is the block brakes. Block brakes are way out, typically away from the operator panel, and they are hard to hear. So you hear... You push the button in at the control panel and you could just barely hear them way out there just going but it's like okay i heard them they're working another thing you want to look for is faults when you actuate them they so open the brakes and hold it for a second and then it starts going you know air 484 uh service brake number three pressure low when indicated to be high it's like okay something's needs to wake up out there uh, you can warm these things up and those errors will a lot of times go away there's a lot of electromechanical pressure switches proximity sensors everything is working together on these things there is a lot that can go wrong so in the morning time you can't just jump on every single fault because you're going to be there forever trying to figure that out and a lot of times if you simply just kept actuating it they kind of warm up and they start working fine throughout the rest of the day. Again, it's a fine line to walk between knowing what just needs to be warmed up and what is a problem too. So after I've actuated everything, I take the last key and I turn transfer on. Everything shuts off and now there's only a couple lights available and that's in the transfer track. So now I have to physically walk out to the transfer track and then I look at my transfer, transfer selection and I take my table selector and I typically, which is set on run all the time. And there was three trains on this one, but we only use two at a time. So I would say, well, the ones in bay number three and two are ready to go. The one in bay number one is torn apart in rehab. We don't want to go to that one. So go in and I switch the transfer table to bay number two. And then I press the button, this move table starts flashing. Press and hold move table, and the whole transfer table unlocks and starts rolling sideways. And it's very slow, and it goes out there into the middle bay, bay number two, and then slows down 
parks itself right in front of that bay and then you take your finger off the move table button and the pneumatic pins automatically lock in to the transfer table and now the track of transfer is locked with the train house and now I give it one last look and make sure there's no one around the train and even before I do it I yell out there I'll be like hey trains coming out press and hold move train forward and then the train starts to advance from the work bay out onto the transfer track now while it's doing that the track has some little cones at the end that help gather up the guide wheel and road wheel as it slides over those cones and it starts to come onto the track um, most of the time I've never really had problems with bringing them on there the only time I've ever seen any issues is if you started and stopped it a whole bunch of times and literally got the wheel carrier swinging as it was moving forward then you could do some damage you can you can hit the track with the wheel carriers and it doesn't do good but I think if you're smooth one shot bring it on you won't have any problems doing that so bring the train all the way forward 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 it automatically parks itself on transfer again some rides won't some rides you have to watch them and they have marks on there like oh yeah coach four lines up with this mark that we painted on the track okay and you stop it right there and then we move the transfer track and go back to the run position move table now that table is moving with not only i don't know six tons of track probably more than that so that's six tons of track on there but now it's got 14 tons of train sitting on top of it as well and the whole thing is rolling back now fun part about these things is that the transfer wheels underneath are about the same width apart as the rails above the center of mass is got to be easily eight feet above those rails and those rails have no the the rails that the track slides back and forth on there's no up stops to those rails they have roads and they have guides but there's no up stop catch to them theoretically i don't know how it would do this because there's really not enough energy to do it theoretically it could hit something and the entire track could just go boom like that theoretically it's possible I've never seen it happen, never heard about it happen. Your mass is high up off of that thing, but it's moving so slow. And even if you ran into something, which we I've run into stuff before that was on that uh, those transfer rails, it just stops. There's, there's no nothing, but it, it is kind of interesting. So you bring the track all the way back to run. It stops itself again. Take your fingers off. Pins in both directions lock in. Now you've locked into the station, and now you've locked into the service brakes back behind you. And there are, those will be safety brakes in that case. And then there is a move train forward that starts illuminating. And then you press and hold move train forward. Now that train starts to go forward into the station, and it will go like an operational mode. It will go all the way forward and park itself in the home position and stop. Okay, hands off. Back to the selector. Go past table two, and now we're going to three. Now we're going to run out there in three. Now, it is kind of interesting because where those rails for the transfer table, where they stop, and where you stand on this, you're, I'm standing on a catwalk on the side operating the transfer table, which is already four feet past the rail, the run rail of the ride, the roller coaster track. So it's already four feet past that. And then just about a foot behind that, so now five feet backwards, is where the road wheels are for the transfer track itself that the track rolls on. So on bay number three, everyone gets this uneasy feeling about it because as it goes out there, you pass the end of the transfer track table, the, the, the steel that the manufacturer put in. You pass the end of that track and you're still going. And then like where we were, we had a fence where cars were parked on the other side. You pass that fence too, and you're still going. And everyone got the feeling when everyone went out to pick a train off of Bay 3, everyone just got the feeling like it's going to stop, right? 
because we all had this fear that it was just going to keep going, even though there were stops on the end of the track, that even if it did keep going, it would just hit those and it would stop um, because it couldn't overcome those things. But everyone, again, had this fear that the whole transfer track and table was just going to go and then land on a bunch of cars below. Never heard about it, never know nothing else, but it's always one of those fears. <laughs> So uh, you go out, we now do the same exact thing. Lock it into bay three, advance the train from bay three on the transfer track, bring the transfer track back over and lock it into place. Now there's nowhere for that train to go. So now we simply just, we're done at that point in time. Switch is back in the run, run position. Honestly, those switches, you could leave them in any position you want to because outside of moving the table, the ride doesn't care. At least consign didn't care about it, which I agree with. It's unnecessary. So we go back in, and at that point, go back to the main control panel, turn transfer off, and then ride start again. Since the ride was already started and there was no e-stops, I simply hold ride start for a couple seconds, and then everything would start flashing in manual mode again. Go to hit panel view enable, move combs up, and the combs will reassemble themselves. And at that point in time, I can use the unlock feature of the ride and unlock everything. Now that there's a train there, all the comb functions work. So I can go through and I can make sure the light curtains work. I put something in front of the light curtain and try to put the combs down. The light curtain is an optical barrier on both sides of the train. It's meant that if anyone stands in there in that area, if someone's where they shouldn't be, those floors won't work. So you put something in the way of those floors and verify that that it won't go down. Then you move something to the other side, verify it won't go down. Cool. I go unlock seven and eight, six and five, four and three, two and one. And I make sure those sound and work good. And then I go backwards through just because it's easy to do. Unlock all, all of them. I go open up all the restraints till they're full open positions. Go back, hit the lock all cars button. And then I go down. This is one thing I do double check for every mechanic. I don't care where, anytime I bring a train into service, I listen for those eight clicks on the way down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Put the seatbelt in, latch it, go to the next one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Seatbelt in, next one, latch it. When you get good at it, it moves really fast. Like I can take a restraint in one motion, just go down. Not fast, but I mean, I could just go down about like that and know that I've got all my clicks in that restraint. Just keep going, 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 going. Then I take that one and I send it. I send that one out, dispatch. With a bypass key and you don't need the rest of the operators in with a maintenance bypass key. So go into automatic, ride start, hold it, and then panel view enable and start the lift. Now the lift is started in automatic mode. In bypass, my dispatch buttons start flashing. Press and hold dispatch, combs open up, train goes forward. A lot of the comb stuff is not needed if you have a stand-up coaster or an invert coaster because there is no flooring to open. It is simply just do that. Um, so then what I'm listening for is everything to be smooth. The first cycle around, the first train, I'm listening for everything. Mainly what I'm listening to as that train is running, I'm listening to the train itself but I'm just listening to everything in general. As that train moves around, I have not advanced that other train in because I want it to stay there because I want to listen to the other one. I don't want the motors turning on. I want to listen to that train on the track. Once that train does its thing, it comes back. I bring the next train in, combs up, unlock the restraints, lock them all down. I hear the clicks. Cool. I'm going along. I send that train now. Same thing, exactly the same. I listen for that one now. Listen to it while it's out on the track. If it starts making funny noises or anything, that's reason enough to sideline the train and pull it back off the track and say, what's going on? Something sounds funny on this. It's pretty much never happened to me. I don't think I'm there. Well, maybe once or twice. If... I've probably sidelined a train right off the bat, but I honestly can't remember an exact instance as to why I would have done that. But it's typically something sounds funny. Don't know what, can't put your finger on it, but something just doesn't sound right. So you pull it off and reinspect the entire thing. After the two successful cycles, we are going to now 
uh, start doing other testing. So I will take the next train through and I will send it through. And as it goes up the lift hill, there was a service bulletin by B&M that said, hey, you need to stop the train on the lift hill and check and verify that the sprag is holding the weight. So the sprag is the anti-rollback device on the chain that prevents the chain itself from going backwards. Remember, there are four anti-rollback dogs underneath the train or on top of it, depending on which ride you're looking at. Um, but the sprag prevents the chain from rolling backwards. So we actually had a sweet spot. I know standing at the control panel, I could line it up with pillars on another ride across the way. And I knew when the handlebars, the hand grips on the first restraint got right to that vertical set of pillars. As soon as it got there, I hit lift stop. And every time I did that, it would stop. And then I verified it a bunch of times. You have to go, we had to go lock it out and go back on the lift hill and verify that none of the anti-rollbacks were actually locked down. They were, all, they were all waiting to bite into the tooth, but they were all sitting there free. And that was for sure the, the lift hill has, the chain has it. Um, on times when that failed, not like the sprag failed, but I mean, I didn't hit it in the right spot you would hit stop and then the train would settle just that little tiny bit, but one of the uh, dogs would bite into the anti-rollback reel and you would hear it go boom, really loud and clear, just like boom. It's like, ooh, okay, we got a dog to bite in that time. Try it again on the next one. Because I didn't think there was a problem. It was simply just, all right, we'll try it again. Next train around, stopped it, stopped right where it's supposed to. Okay, cool, move along from there. Run cycles, put about three cycles per train on the ride. Now it's time for the block check. Block check for most roller coasters requires two people to work and do this. I actually figured out a way to do it completely by myself, which was pretty cool. Um, but most time you typically have a optical photo eye that you have to put your hand in front of to fool the computer into thinking that there's a train there. So the way it's done with two people is you send the train up, someone goes out to the very, very end of the brake run out in the service brakes, and they wait there. And then you go, okay, you send the first train up and over, and you send the second train right behind it. And the first train goes up and over, and then as soon as that train gets up into the block brakes, you flag that photo eye. And then the blocks go, hold, there's something in front of me, and it locks that train up. And the other train continues up, 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 up until it gets to lift park. And then it goes clunk, stops at lift park because there's a train in front of it. It's like, okay. Then you start the ride back up, release the block brakes. This is an automatic as soon as you hit ride start because that fault is now cleared out of the service brakes. Hit ride start. The one in the block starts to roll. Then you go back and you start the lift, send the one on the lift over. Now the other one comes up into the service brakes and then you the, the same mechanic is now in the safety and they flag the photo eye in safety and it stops that train in the service brakes. And then that other train goes along and it gets stopped in the block brakes again. So, okay, cool. And then you t remove your hand, you walk up, they hit start again and as the train starts to roll forward, you flag the photo eye and transfer. And that train stops again. Okay, reset, start up. That train rolls into transfer now. Now, as soon as that rolls into transfer, you can hit ride start up there and get the one out of the block. That one now comes out of the block and it comes up into the service brakes and it can't go any further because there's one in transfer now, one block between it. One in transfer, one in service. They're locked up there. Then I move the train forward and stop it in the station and then the one in service naturally just starts to roll out and it comes up back to the one and transfer. Block check complete. Sign everything off, turn it over to operations, done deal. Now, probably one of the questions is, how'd you do that by yourself? All right, so dispatch, first train going. While it trains on the lift hill, try to dispatch it again, it can't. There's your first block check. Good. All right. It goes up and over the lift hill. Send the second one. 
goes up the lift, up, 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 up. When that other one gets into the block brake, I hit ride stop and I stop that one in the block brake. Then I go into my lift mode and I send the one on the lift hill up to the top, almost to the very top, but not to the very top. I stop it just short because I know where that is. Then I go back to full automatic mode and I go start, 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 start everything back up and really quick start the lift back up. As that train starts rolling through the block, the lift starts up and it sends it that last like five feet and then it goes clunk and then it airs out because the block is still occupied and it starts going, okay, all right, all right. So that one leaves the block. I real quick go to manual mode, clear the air, switch it back, automatic start, start the lift back up. Start the lift, it goes up and over before that other train gets the service brakes. Other train comes up into the service brakes, I hit ride stop. And I wait until that other train is almost to the block brakes, and then I hit ride start again. And then that train starts to roll forward in the service, and that other train gets up into the block and stops. And here comes my other one from service. That one in the block isn't moving. So go through service, clear service. Block still doesn't move. Now it's in safety. Block still doesn't move. Clear safety. Now it's in transfer. Block opens. Train starts to roll forward. Now, at this point, I do two checks at once. I advance a train halfway from transfer into the station. Halfway. Stop it. Take my hands off. That train comes up into the service brakes. Stops again. Okay. Now it's recognizing that the transfer is occupied and the station is occupied at the same time. Then I move the train all the way forward until it homes in the station. At one point, in, when it homes in the station, it releases the train out of the service brakes. And I'm like, one man block check complete. Got it. It's a complicated process. You need to know a lot about it and it, you have to have everything exact. Um, so it's not something most guys could not duplicate what I did, but uh, I've showed it to a lot of people and, and no one can fault it. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's 100% using the system in automatic single man block check. Pretty cool. The key thing to take away from any block check, and I've gone over this before, is anytime you do a block check, no matter what ride you're working on, what's the one thing you need to be ready to do? And that is e-stop the ride, just in case your block check fails. So I got one in the safety, or one in the service brakes, and the other one comes up into the block, and those brakes don't stop for some reason. E stop, lock that thing down. But never had it happen before. But that's, I always tell mechanics, if you're running a ride and you're doing a block check, you need to have your hand like on the E stop button, like resting your hand there, just in case. All you need is just to twitch your muscle and push that E stop down. You're the last line of defense there. You get your block check, you sign it off, that ride is ready to go. Some rides have nuisance things, you have to go back to them afterwards. Like the lift hill might time out on particular rides. So you might have to go back and turn the lift hill back on. Um, things you might forget to do while you're there, uh, which is sometimes the, the PA system is turned on, but the audio, the music that plays on the PA was turned off. You have to go back. Sometimes the kids don't have keys to get in the control rooms. You have to go back and turn that on and some minor little things like that. You might get a call back, which is something sounds funny. There's a problem with this restraint. Can you just please come out and look at this? Okay. The majority of times, if you get a call back, it's because the ride faulted, which happens. There's not much you can do about it. Early startup in the morning time. Sometimes the rides just fault. Other times it might be something like the ride's in motion and a bird flew across the photo eye, locked the ride up. Happens, but... Those are some of the simple simple callbacks you get done. A long video, I know, but in a nutshell, that is pretty much how you run rides up. And I hope you enjoyed the startup because I went pretty in depth in that last startup procedure. I mean, that's almost training for some people. <laughs> ah, so hope you enjoyed everything. If you did, make sure you like and subscribe. I'm sure there'll be plenty of stories in the comments if everyone wants to start looking through the comments section. Everyone loves to get on these and start with the stories. And I love to read the stories because, man, 
the 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 crazy things that happens with some of the mechanics out there they're they're really something to to look at so if you want some cool stories i'm sure just start reading comments down below i'm ryan the ride mechanic have a good evening stay safe and as always stay off the air gates bye <laughs>